Hey programmers, welcome back to day 15 of the Advents of Code. Let's take a look at today's input. It's really just going to be a list of some numbers. And these numbers actually start a sequence for a little game. So we'll kind of step through how this game works. So we have these seed numbers of 0, 3, and 6. And so what we'll say is uh, the first three numbers of our sequence are exactly that, right? 0, 3, as well as 6. So notice before the colons over here, I'm just going to denote uh, the number of that element within the sequence. Now that we have used up all of our seed values, now we follow a very particular pattern. To generate the next number of the sequence, what I do is look at my last number and also locate uh, the previous time that it appeared. Right now, my last number is six, and that was actually the very first time it appeared. So by default, I'll just make my next number zero. And we'll just continue this pattern, right? At this point, if I wanna generate my fifth number, I would have to look at my last number of zero. And I also have to locate where it appeared previously. So if I look at this zero, it also appeared previously at index one, right? So if I look at these two positions, right? It appeared at index four in the latest, and then index one previously. If I take the difference between four and one, then that result is three. So that will be the next number of my sequence. And this carries over a little bit, right? So now I need to generate the sixth number of my sequence. So I look at my last element of three and also decide where it appeared previously. Right, it appeared at positions five and two. I take the difference of those and that gives me a result of three. Right. Similarly, for my next element at position seven, I look at the three and the last two times it appeared. And technically these would just be at a difference of one, right? At indices six and five respectively. So there I have the one result. Now to generate position eight, I look at my last number, which was one. And this was actually the first time that the one appeared. So I default it to a zero. To generate my ninth element, look at my last uh, element of zero, and also the previous time it appeared, it looks like it appeared at indices eight and four, and their difference is four, so I just add it here. Finally, for the tenth element, I look at my last element of four. That was the first time it appeared, so it must be a zero. Cool, so in the long run, uh, what this problem has us do is return some arbitrary number within the sequence. I think uh, for our kind of main problem that we have to solve, we have to return the 30 millionth number of this sequence. So not only do we wanna just you know, generate uh, the numbers, but we probably also have to do it in an efficient manner. So let's think about a strategy for this one. Well, I know to solve this problem, I need to recognize you know, basically a history of where numbers have appeared. So I think the move is to maybe use some additional space to remember that the previous two places that I saw some number. So we'll kind of trace through this once again, but this time we'll do it more programmatically. I think the key to victory here is to maintain some history object or some sort of mapping that maps a element to the last two positions that it appeared. So if I have my initial seed values of zero, three, and six, then I'll just also seed them in my history, right? So I can say that element zero appeared at index one, element three appeared at index two, and then element six appeared at index three. Cool. And notice that each of these subarrays right now only contain uh, one position, and that's because they only appeared once. In the long run, some of my elements may have a subarray with length two, of course. So now we'll start generating our next numbers, right? To generate the fourth number of our sequence, we still look at our last uh, number, which is six in this case, and I locate it within my history object. If I look at the subarray associated with six, I see that it only contains one element. So that must mean that this is only the first time that I've actually seen element six. So logically in my actual sequence, I should just take this number as zero. And once I actually put a number down in my sequence, I should also update the history object. So now the key of zero should point to one and also position four. Cool. Now my next iteration, I look at that last element, which is zero. I locate it in my history object. And since there are two positions now in the history, I could just take the difference between them, right? Four minus one gives me three. Now that I'm saying that my fifth element of the sequence is three, I also must update my history at key of three, right? So now three looks like it has two previous positions. Now to generate the sixth element, I do the same thing. I look at my history at three, take the difference of that five and two, gives me another three. And I just carry over this logic, always being sure to update my history object. Notice that if we look at our history object at the key of three, its subarray has three elements. To solve this one efficiently, I think what we should do is actually uh, maintain the subarrays such that they don't go past a length of two, right? 
So what I'll do is actually drop the very first element of the history. So I don't need the two anymore. At any point in time, I want the subarrays to just contain the last two positions uh, that I saw this element. So that way I keep uh, my subarrays at a constant size. So now I generate the seventh element. I look at my last element of three, but as a key of my history object, then I take a difference between its two elements in its subarray, right? Six minus five gives me one. And here we actually reach a new case. And we know that this is the first time that we're hitting uh, the element of one. So I have to add it to my history and give it the correct uh, position, right? So just one points to a subarray of seven. Now to generate the eighth element of our sequence, we look at the last element of one and we see that its subarray only has one thing inside of it. So that must have been the very first time that we saw it. So I just automatically take this number as zero. And when I do that, I need to be sure to update the history for zero. So I'm gonna add eight to it, but then drop the a one, right? Because it was at the front, always tracking just the last two. And this pattern just carries on until we finish up uh, all of these iterations. Cool, and there we have it. Just like before, you can see that the 10th number of the sequence is zero. So this logic doesn't seem uh, too fancy. All we have to do is maintain this history object in a proper way. If we take a quick glance at the overall complexity of this, we know that we're gonna have a loop to just uh, create our sequence and iterate. So I think I'm gonna get O of N iterations just from generating the sequence. And at any point in time, what we also had to do was at every iteration, do an O of one lookup within our history object, right? I had to check, hey, is this element in my history object? And we know that the size of this history object is going to be linear uh, in the number of elements in our sequence as well. So overall, I think I'm looking at an O of n time and O of n space complexity. With that, I think let's jump right in. So here we are in my text editor. I just have some cases that we should be able to pass. So we just wanted to find this solve method. Just going to take in our starting sequence. So I'll say starting sequence as well as the n, right? So I want to return in the long run the nth number of the sequence. So let's start by setting up um, all of those data structures we need. So I think the most important one would be our history. So I'll say const history. And because I anticipate uh, the history object or history data structure getting very large, I'm gonna to prefer to use a JavaScript map here. So I'll say new map. A map is a very similar uh, entity to like a JavaScript object. However, it does perform a lot better when you have a lot of keys. So this should make it a little bit faster, but overall I'll still get some key value uh, pairing using a map. Now let me just iterate through my starting sequence. So I'll say four, I'll say let i equals zero, i is less than starting sequence dot length. And of course hit every i. And I wanna do a few things. Let me definitely add this into the history. So I'll say history dot set. And if I want to give it a key, I want to make the actual element itself the key. So maybe I'll say const num equals starting sequence at index i. So I'm gonna make the number itself the key and the value will be the position where I found it, but really an array containing the position, right? Because occasionally these arrays will grow as large as length two, right? Storing the last two times I saw it. Nice, so that should give me uh, my nice history. And then I think along with that, I just need a variable to kind of store the last number I've seen. So maybe I'll say let last equals null. And then I'll just keep reassigning it over here. So I'll say last equals the number. And that way, um, by the time I finish this for loop, I would have my last number set to six, right? So let's just do a quick check, and make sure that we have some uh, good initial state for this, right? So we'll console.log what the history map looks like, as well as what my last number looks like. So let's give that a go. We'll run the solution. So that map looks good and my last number uh, is six. Cool, so now we're ready to actually begin our main algorithm. So we wanna definitely establish a loop um, until we hit the nth number of our sequence. So there are really a few different ways we can do that. Maybe I'll set my last or my let count equal to three or really technically equal to the starting sequence length. Cause it looks like in my other inputs, I have a different sequence length. So starting sequence dot length. So that means my count begins at three and I wanna keep looping, we'll say while 
the count of numbers is less than n, right? So this should be a nice loop I can use. And of course, through every iteration, I definitely want to increase that count. Nice. So now uh, over to our core logic, right? What I want to do is always look at the last number of my sequence and really look at its history, right? So maybe I'll say uh, in the history map, let me go ahead and get uh, the entry for this last number. Cool. So that should give me the value associated with it. But I have to really watch out here. I know that sometimes the length of that uh, history could be of one element or two elements long. So maybe I'll just get that. So I'll say const positions. So this will be the array. And I want to check the length of it, right? So in one scenario, I could have positions.length being one. In another scenario, it's going to be length two. Those are the only possibilities, right? If it's in the object at all. And I know that if it's the last element I've seen, then it should be part of the history map, right? Cool. So according to uh, the logic, they say that, hey, if that was the first time that you saw that last element, then your new element should just be zero. So what I definitely wanna do is set my last to be zero. But then I also need to update the history for zero, right? So I can do something like history.get zero. So that gives me the array for zero. And I want to push into it uh, this new position, right? So I saw this, we'll say at my count. So that should be good to go. And then along with that, I want to you know, also be sure to make my history have a fixed length. So I don't wanna keep pushing elements again and again, because that would make things a little too too long for me. So I'm probably gonna need to save this statement a few times. So maybe I'll save this as my const zero positions, like that. And then I can just add my latest position into that array. Then I'll also need to resize it technically, right? So if zero positions dot length. If that right now is greater than two, then I can trim something out. So I can just say zero positions dot shift. So notice that I'm adding elements to the back of my array, and then I'm removing them from the front, sort of like a queue, making sure that I have arrays that are at most length two. Cool, so that code's looking pretty good. Now I have the else scenario, which is pretty, pretty similar, right? So else, that means that the uh, history uh, of the number contains two things, right? So let me go ahead and get those positions. So I'll get positions and I'll get the last two positions. So I'll say const, maybe I'll destructure them here. I'll grab my maybe A and B. And I know that B would be a greater number than A. So just simply calculating their difference, you just do B minus A, right? So I'll give me that new, we'll say, new number. Cool. And now I have a few scenarios, right? It could be the first time I'm seeing this number or it could be the second, third, or fourth time, right, and so on. So I'll just go ahead and check maybe, like if the history, so if I've seen this before, so if history has this new num, then I can do some logic. Otherwise I haven't seen it, so do something else, right? So the easier case is if I've already used up this number. So it should be as simple as getting its array. So I can say history.get, get the positions based on that new number, right? And I need to do the adjusting for it once again. So maybe I'll save this as const new num positions, sort of like this. Pretty symmetric what we did for the zero, right? So for my new number positions, I'm going to add this new position, which is count into it. So new pos num positions dot push the count. And now I, along with that, I need to do the same sort of checking for the length, right? So over here, I'll go ahead and adjust the length, but this time for my new num positions, it's probably a better way to dry up this code, right? But for now, we'll just do it like this. Um, now in the else scenario, that means that I have not seen this before, so I need to initialize it in my map for the very first time, right? So I think regardless, whenever I hit uh, this else statement, I'm definitely going to set my last to be the new num. 
Um, but now in this else statement, it's the first time, so I need to add it. So I'll say history.set. I'm going to set a new number within my history. And I'll initialize it just with an array containing the first position I'm seeing it at, which is just simply count, right? So count represents the position of the number in the sequence. So that code looks pretty good. You might have some off by one errors here. I am increasing my counts every time. I think let's just give it a shot. So what I'll be sure to do is maybe return um, the final value that's in my last, right? Because I know I'm going to stop iterating once count is equal to n. So maybe this will work out nicely. Let's try a few examples. Console.log these. So let's give this one a run. Run solution.js. So our answers so far are 4, 0, and 421. So the first three are correct. Looks like our fourth example is still running. Should finish in a little bit though. Nice, and there we see our 436. Cool, so that's really all there is to uh, this problem. Uh, the key thing to watch out for as you implement this one is you definitely want to uh, do keep the time complexity in mind uh, for your solution because you could get uh, quite a longer runtime, right? So we're making a trade off here. We're kind of using up um, n space in our history uh, just to ensure that we can quickly recognize in the previous times we've seen that number. So there we have it, day 15, short and sweet. Catch you next time for day 16.